but I'm going to start a new video. Okay, so I'm going to open up this model and I'm going to screen, share my screen here. Um, way too much welcome, but maybe he doesn't want that all throughout the class. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, we had taken a look at this model last time and I want to remind you in broad features of it. So, within this model, we have sort of a stylized theory of personhood as represented by a person class. For those now from computer science background, this is a bit like a, a class is a bit like a cookie cutter. It can be used to create many particular cookies. Uh, a class here, a person class can be used to create, it's kind of a template for people, right? Um, so we have the person class and this person class for tenets of object-oriented programming wraps up in one place the characteristics or attributes of that person, their properties, such as their color, their location, but it also captures their behavior. Now, I got a question last time, you know, like, okay, so, so this is based on Java, like, like, where's the for loop here? Like, where's the if statement? What, what is this? Like, it turns out that the world of programming languages is a broad one. Like, the world of having specifications of behavior in a precise enough way to be executable, to be runnable, is a broad one. There's many types of languages out there. Some of you are in 340 right now. How many are in 340 right now? Okay, um, I salute you. Um, 340 will expose you, I think, to Scala and to Prolog. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Two fine languages, quite different from Java. Scala is one of my favorites. Um, and uh, and there are visual programming languages which use graphical representation. And it turns out that this is an example of a of a visual programming language that is based on UML, Unified Modeling Language, um, used in software engineering. Yeah. And this is what's called a state chart. Mm -hmm. And it detects at once possible states a person could be in, the actions that change the states, so those are these transitions, and the rules that govern whether or not that action will take place, will fire, right? Or when it will fire. For example, this occurs with a certain rate, a certain chance per unit time, a, a so-called hazard rate. Um, this is a, it's actually not a probability, it's a probability density, it's a temporal probability density for those more comfortable with math concepts. It's a chance per unit time, in this case, per day. It's over here hidden by this, by this widget, per day. Um, that they will that they will go from the infectious state to the recovered state. So at any one time, a person is either susceptible or they're infectious or they're recovered. And over time, they will evolve according to these transitions. Um, so this transition is a chance per unit time. This transition, by contrast, is triggered by a message. And that message will represent something in the model. Does anyone want to posit a guess, surmise what that might represent? This transition? That's a phase of infection. Yeah, it's, it's a transmission of infection. Exactly. And what, what might that message be? What? Those people are getting. Yeah, so it's one person transmitting infection to another, like spreading it. Like if I were to pull down my mask and cough or something, and you know, and you were to get infected from that. Uh, um, yeah, so it's it's through contact as a transmission of, in this case, a pathogen. Later we'll see that for influence, rumors, and spread of ideas and innovation and so on. But here it'll be spread a pathogen to so someone who's susceptible, boom, they get exposed by someone else and they become infected. And you'll notice in the, who's infecting them? Who's infecting the susceptible? 
Can I, anyone tell me who, who does it take? It takes two to tango. Who infects is susceptible? An infected person. An infected person. So, so a person who's susceptible gets exposed and becomes infectious, but there needs to be somewhere else in contact with them. An infectious person would be here, right? That would be a different person. And that person, while in that state, undergoes contact. You could kind of move this around and you know I can I can label if you wanted, but there's contact. So you notice while they're in this state with a certain rate, and I'm not going to explain why this is right now, but uh, uh, you can trust that it's um, uh, that there is a uh, a reason for it. Um, so uh, that's anyway. Um, so uh, they're sending an infection message, okay? And um, and this infection message here is what exposes other people to to pathogen. And if that other person that they expose, that other neighbor of theirs, neighbor in space, north, south, east, west, hmm? if that other neighbor is exposed, if that neighbor happens to be susceptible, they would get infected, okay? So a person who is infectious will be undergoing uh, a contact process that will infect a different person. This is describing a process, a process of, as we call it in health, a natural history of infection. Um, by which someone might go from this state to this state to this state. And it describes this little theory. Well, when someone's infectious, they get they contact others with a certain rate and they send a message to uh they they, you know, uh periodically at this rate send messages to other people, okay, to, to infect them. Um I want to chat with Wade about that at some point. But um in any case, uh so this is the process uh, here. Now, these people are not, as I've been alluding, they're not solitudes. They're placed in an overall environment, which goes by the name of Maine. Mm -hmm. And that overall environment um, is kind of the uh, overall global world in which they're placed. It's the stage on which they strut, these agents. And agents are placed in here. And their location is actually indicated by these little little sort of areas there. And, and you can actually see it in person. There's a little rectangle up here. Um, so they're placed in this environment and arrayed in a in a in an environment. And if you go and look in Maine and you were to scroll down here, you could see space at network. They're arranged in a arranged in a in a certain regular layout. And they have eight neighbors, north, south, east, west, northeast, southwest, southeast, and, and uh, northwest. Um, and uh, by being placed in neighbor and with these neighbors, um, they're in contact with those neighbors and, and infectious people can spread it. Okay, so this is the idea. Um, so this is a model of, of, of uh, infection spread. And at the very start of this model, on startup, there's a delivery to a random agent that starts them infected. Okay. So here we have the elements of infection spread in a model. We have people that start mostly susceptible, one starts effective, and and then the infected people expose others nearby them, have contact with others, with random ones. Those other people are exposed. If those other people remain have remained susceptible to that point, they'll become infectious themselves and then they'll start exposing people, but eventually they recover, okay? Are we okay with this, Ardalan? So I have a question. So can you take my, can the people who are recovering go to transmission again? So right now they cannot. There's there's no transition from recovered to susceptible right now. Now we're going to come back to that point. But right now in this model, this theory has no 
recovery back to susceptible. We will be seeing that later. Uh, and we'll see the consequences are profound. But right now, we don't have that. Okay. Okay. So this is a theory we've articulated with this model. It's a theory that's quite specific in its formulation. We can go, we can go look at what these contact rates are, infection probabilities, average illness duration. Those are actually specified as what are called parameters in Maine. And, and we can run this model with different assumptions about this. So here's the so-called baseline. The simulation will run with an average illness duration of 10, a contact rate of one per day, an infection probability um, uh, of 0.5 per discordant contact, per contact between a susceptible and infective, et cetera, and a total population of, of uh, just under 50,000. So we're going to run it. We're going to enact that theory and see what comes of it. Here we go. Okay. So we're going to run it. I've started it here and it's going to start. You see it down here starting off. Now yours may start somewhere different and I'll come back to that point. But you notice it spreading up. So again, what's going on here? Can anyone say? Yellow is, and you'll see the colors aligned with how it's presented here. Yellow is susceptible, red is infectious, and gray is recovered. So can anyone describe roughly what's going on here? Yeah. And uh, name again? Oh. Oh. The entire population starts out as uh, susceptible. Good. And uh, one random person gets infected and yeah. spreads to another and spreads yeah. to another and spreads to another. Good. And eventually, determined like based on the rate of, of recovery, the person heals, and then there's uh, the gray. And that continues until the whole thing. Good, good, good. Um, so that's exactly right. We, we have this infection process going on. And I had noted last time as we ran this that there are some qualitative features of this, some visual features that come out that um, uh, are, you know, striking, right? Um, so we see kind of a, a ring of swords going out, just kind of a, a, a band around it of more red and then less red internally. It's mostly gray in there. Those features were not programmed into the model. There's nothing in them that said make an expanding ring, right? There's nothing that said make the outer part of the ring more red than the internal part, make it mostly gray and so on. Instead, these features are, and I'm looking for a word from you folks. You heard it during the video. It begins with E. Yes, in the back? Emergent. Emergent. So we call something, we, we term something as giving rise to emergence. If it has properties for the whole, they can't be found in any of the parts, any of the pieces, any one of those pieces. So we could go search this model all day for something about a ring and where it tells us about the ring and how thick the ring is, but we wouldn't find it because there's nothing that it pre-specifies about the ring. The ring is generated by the interaction of all these assumptions. That gives rise to this emergent process, which has this behavior that can't be reduced to any one of a single one of its parts. Does it depend? I'll be with you just a second. Does it depend on the fact that they have a infectious state? You bet it does. Does it depend on the fact there's a susceptible state? Yeah. Does it depend on the fact the infectious state is communicating an uh, infection to neighbors? You bet. Does it depend on the fact that you know each each person can communicate to the eight neighbors around it, absolutely. Does it depend on the fact that the recovered cannot go back to susceptible? You bet it does. But it's a result of all of those being entangled, right? It gives rise to this. Do you see that? Do you see that? It emerges from it. And uh, Mohammed? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, 
I was, I was wondering, does this model uh, shows the wave property of, of the infection? We will be seeing that shortly. We'll be seeing that shortly, and it's related to r function. So thank you. Um, yes, it's a good setup for just a few minutes from now before the class closes here. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's this notion of emergence here. It gives rise to properties of the whole that can't be reduced to the parts. And really that's a, a key part of why we simulate things because systems in the world are and they're complex, not merely in a descriptive sense, not merely complicated. They are complex in the sense that the whole transcends the parts. It, it's something different than the sum of the parts. It's something different than the average of the parts. It's, it's something that has different features. And when we have systems like that, they surprise us. And when we try to control systems like that, we could be an Einstein, but we'll be foiled. It'll be a fool's errand because we, we, we are not endowed with that sort of um, mathematical understanding to allow us to simulate out in our heads the consequences of our assumptions. The simulation models we have an assistant. It's like a crutch or a boot or a cane provides assistance to someone who, who has a broken leg or a broken foot. It's a prosthesis for the mind. It helps us achieve closer to full functionality despite our natural limitations, just like a cane or a crutch lets us get around despite having a broken leg or broken foot. It's a learning prosthesis. And it's because of this surprising behavior, this emergent behavior, that we often get whacked on the head if we don't have these things, because we'll get blowback. We'll we'll undertake a policy and it'll blow back in our face. It'll there'll be unexpected things that are generated, and we end up we end up in a situation worse off. For example, you lower the amount of nicotine in cigarettes in hopes that it will make people less addicted and they end up smoking more cigarettes to get the same nicotine. And they they get even worse exposure to the carcinogen because of that, right? Um, uh, that's an example of a blowback, you know, is the decision that probably did net harm. Um, or you lower the tar in cigarettes thinking, well, it'll I mean, smokers are less exposed to, to cancer-causing compounds. What could go wrong? And you find, well, more people continue smoking instead of quitting. Um, and again, you get blowback. So it behooves us when we're dealing with complex systems to proceed judiciously, to, to, to try to inform our decisions by with decision-making tools that help us make better decisions, make more informed decisions, more judicious decisions. Okay. Now, this is a consequence of this. Um, I'd like to play this out a little bit more, I, I, but I'd like to draw your attention up here to, to the top. And I'm gonna run this for a little bit more, about twice this time, to about time 50, okay? Here we go. So it's running out. And we can actually speed it up with this if we want to, but it's easy to speed it up too much. I'm going to speed up. Now it's two times the speed. And time is ticking on. Okay, there we go. So it's going up to about time time 50, and I'm I'm stopping it. Okay? I'm, I'm pausing. Okay, so here we are. We have a count of infectious people here. A count of recovered here. And a con is susceptible here. Con 50. Anyone want to surmise? Right now we have about 5,000 people in Texas out of this 50 or so thousand. How many people do you think will be infectious at time 100? Anyone want to guess? Okay, so the so one idea is maybe it's exponential because maybe one person might infect four more who each infect four who each infect four and you get this 
doubling on, right? If even if it just went two, one infects becomes, you know, infects two people, and each of them infects two, become four, and then eight, and then 16, and 32, and so on. And all those powers of two computer scientists should love. Yes. Can you see the yellow area that I see? Oh. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Okay, there we go. Okay, and your name? Uh, ben. Ben, and, and Alex here? I think it'll stay relatively stable and then taper off at some point. Okay. Okay, so some different theories here. And, and Ben, did you want to? I think it'll, it'll accelerate until that one of those edges, the uh, edge of the board, uh, and then we'll start seeing it plateau off. Okay. And then it'll start dropping after that. Okay, okay. I, 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 I like the thinking going on here, Adelon. Uh, I mean, as we say, I mean, if we, if we consider it in the COVID 19 thing, it will yeah. have different uh, spikes. So, for example, okay. Uh, because when people get infected, they think like that because of the beliefs that they won't be infected again, so they will wear masks and they come together, uh -huh. and there will be another inspection or another version of COVID nineteen will emerge that kind of uh, the the people who are infected uh -huh. still uh, they can be uh, mm -hmm. suspicious to that um, to get that new COVID nineteen just like that. the new variant. So the mm -hmm. new spot will happen. So. I think the pattern will come, uh, will happen all over again. I mean, it's just like a normal uh, cough or sore throat that people get um, influenza every single year because people will always get it. This pattern will never get to a zero or a very short number. It always spikes. Okay. It matters like how much we can uh, kind of uh, make sure that this spike doesn't get bigger as just like its original version. Okay. So, I heard some some subtle thinking there, but some of those a lot of those matters aren't aren't in this model right now, right? Like right now, this is like as simple as it can get. Like because people don't even get infected twice, right? They stay forever, forever recovered, right? Um, and because they stay forever recovered, they're not going to get infected again. And so the the capacity of this model. Right now, to show the waves is limited. And what I'm hearing is some things like from Ben's side about advancing out and Alex's side that are showing, well, okay, now it's it's going down. And what I heard is from Alex's comments earlier that for a while there'll still be infected people around because they're still sitting here, but but the number is going down right now. And we're going to get to Ardalan, something closer to Ardalan's uh, idea in a little bit. And somewhere in here, <laughs> there is one lucky person, right? Um, one person who dodged it all um, and uh, and somehow managed to to stay stay protected. Okay, so um, here we. Oh, in fact, too, <laughs> uh, she has a friend down there. Okay, that that's awesome. Um, okay, now what I'd like to do is to ask, okay, and I'm watching the time here. Suppose we were to refine this theory. So some of you here know that I was the chief modeler for the province. I was borrowed by the health system at the beginning of the pandemic to serve our health system along with a large part of my life, including Wade, who looked at the leading role, and I served in that role for a year, a little bit more than a year, meeting a couple times a week, typically with Dr. Shahab and, and meeting with others throughout the health authority planning. And one of the questions that was asked to me early on was an outbreak in Wolosh in Saskatchewan's north. Um, and the outbreak uh, was being managed through door-to-door -door screening, and they were looking to any guidance we could give them for models. Way played a big role in this as well. One of the questions I was asked is, well, what if, what if COVID-19, what if you can get infected more than once? What would that imply if you don't have permanent immunity when you're infected? And I heard that from Ardalan earlier. I think that's a really interesting question. Suppose we wanted to modify this theory. It's not a theory, right? It's not necessarily correct, but it helps us understand the implications of that theory but what if we wanted to examine this case of if we could now say 
suppose people could be infected more than once. Suppose people um, could get get infected not just one time but multiple times. How do we? How might we modify that model to allow people to get infected more than once? And uh, I am uh, name help me. Uh, Ojul. 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 Yes. Yes. And so idea. Um, so if a person has recovered, they probably have developed some sort of immunity towards it too. So it won't be the same as the first time. Okay. So there may be some rate they can get susceptible or just okay. Okay. And and uh, excellent, excellent. Um uh Ardalan. So they won't uh, necessarily turn to um, I mean it depends to look at it this way. So for example, they are recovered, they won't be they technically return to the suspicious that yes, they will get it again, but sometimes they even get to the infection without getting back to the earth. Okay, so that's that's an interesting thing. Let's look at these as time allows one at a time. So I first want to add this one where they can go back to susceptible. Okay. And let's see the consequences. We'll, we'll look at this one where they can go directly back, uh, get infected again a, a bit later. Okay. Um, and uh, and I think that's an interesting one. So I'm going to go to the palette over here. Do you see this palette? So sorry, I should have sort of walked you through this. So over here is a projects and a palette. And I'd like you to drag in a transition here from, from the state chart area. Sorry, it, it's it's this little red one. So in the palette, you have a choice of a bunch of sub palettes, and you should choose the agent sub palette. And from the agent sub palette, there's a state chart area, and I dragged in one of the transitions there. So I'll do it again. I'm going to drag it in and be careful with this. I'm going to hitch it up so that it is docked with this recovered. You see green, it turns green. Ladies and gentlemen, green is the color and state charts are the game. You need to make sure this is docked, okay? So this is should be green. Green is good. And then you drag it over here. So the, the downstream arrow side goes to susceptible. Make sure it's it's pointed the right way. The, the, the pointy end is up. And I'm going to, just for aesthetic sake, so I'm going to double click on this and cause a little blibbit to appear. And I'm going to drag it, OK, like that. And you can click on multiple places and make it real beauty-like if you want to. But I'm going to leave it like this for the moment. Okay, in the interest of time. Okay, so how did I do that? I went um, up to the palette, I went to the agent, I went to drag a transition, and I put it here. Now, this specifies an action that, that allows them to go from recovered to susceptible, but there needs to be a rule associated with it. Right now, it says triggered by timeout. I want to change that. I want to make it a uh, a rate transition. Actually, let's keep it a timeout. We'll first start it with a timeout, and it'll be a timeout of 150 days. Okay, I'm actually going to change this. I apologize, but I'm going to make it a timeout of um, of of 100 days. Okay, 100 days. There we go. Okay. So I changed this to be fired once they've been exactly in the recovered state for 100 days. Okay. You okay with that? Okay, let's run it. Let's enact the consequences of that theory. We've just changed our theory and we're going to run the simulation and, and we're going to see what happens. Okay. Okay, so 100 days after being infected, people are going to be susceptible. Exactly 100 days. So I'm going to run it and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom out down here just so I can see it. I, I went over to this developer panel uh over here, which you can get up here if you if you push this button here. And and I'm gonna I, I did zoom out here. Okay. So here we go. It's time 17 days, 18 days. Do you see anything different yet? 
Anyone see anything different yet? No, why not? Because we've gone under the first spot. Yeah, we they haven't yet they haven't yet had a chance to be recovered long enough to to become susceptible, right? They need a hundred days here, right? A hundred days. Okay. Okay, so when's the first time we'd expect any difference? Yeah, about a hundred for the very first person who was infected. So I'm gonna run it out here. And here we are, okay, it's approaching 75, 80, okay, 86, okay, here we go. What do you think is gonna start happening? Oh, huh? again, yeah. What's that? Again, in the middle, that near the virus, so it's again going to start. Okay, okay, so, so what do you think is gonna happen? Infection. So, um, it's a race condition, right? Okay, there you go. Oh, God. Here's the new wave. Omicron. Um, you know, it's got us. Okay. Um, yes, Ardalai. So why it started from two different places? Like, last time it started from one place. Now it started from two places. Why do you think it started from multiple places? Anyone want to say? Yeah, some people didn't have a chance to recover. And your name, sir? Tony. So like they're disaffectable, like it's the span and it sort of contact with the infection in people. Yes. That's why they start to break. Oh, okay. That's right. And so these people who were recovered become susceptible in many places, right? And and so happens that some of them are in contact with these with these recovered. Now, what do you think this graph looks like up above that counts the number of people who are infected? Like yeah. Oh God. Oh no, not again. Not again. XBB 1.5. Um, okay. Here you go. Here you go. Here is here is your cycle, right? Did we program that in? Did we tell it make it have cycle mode? This is emerges from it. Now, suppose we had changed that. I'm gonna ask you a, a final question here. Suppose instead we had changed it to not 100 days, but 150. What do you think would happen? So then she's like, what do you mean? Because it's going to take more time, so everyone could get recovered. Like, you, you have yeah, so maybe everyone is going to be able to, to get recovered. So there's no infectives around by the time. And in fact, look what happened here. It went extinct, ladies and gentlemen. It went extinct. So what happened? Why did it go extinct? Can anyone say? Look, it's all susceptible. There was no successful work with the first person. Yeah. So it just happened. It just happened that by the luck of the draw, the the remaining people who remained infective recovered before you had this this uh their neighbors uh become susceptible and exposed okay now we got to get back to that normal 10 so we go further but uh i hope that gives you a little bit of glimpse of some of emergence and so on and i'm looking forward to exploring some of these ideas more with you for next lecture okay Thank you. And I'll be posting this as normal. Thank you.